This is very exciting. My first job out of college was as a cryptanalyst, a code breaker, for the U.S. National Security Agency. I worked there for about six years, and then I left for private industry. And the founder of the company who hired me, one of the first things he asked me to do was to write the organization's information security policy. Now, being a code breaker really doesn't train you to write an information security policy, but I was young, gung-ho. I said, okay, I can do this. So I looked at the U.S. Orange Book, I looked at all the other resources, and I found all this information on security policies. And I looked at every policy that could possibly apply to people, process, or technologies. Picked them all, put them in this document, it ended up being almost 100 pages, and it was a thing of beauty. Any type of security control you wanted, any type of security requirement, it was in this policy. And as you can imagine, it was a complete failure. There was no way the organization could use this. Even though if you went down requirement by requirement, you could make an argument, this is designed to do this, this is designed to do that. It was just too much. And what I'm finding increasingly in the OT or ICS security space is that we are doing that to our people and our technology. We're just finding anything that could possibly help and layering out it on and calling it cyber hygiene or something else. And I think what we need to be doing in 2021, 2022, and in the future is actually focusing on less. Let's look at people first. When, when you hear this concept of people, you say, well, people are the problem or everyone needs to be responsible for security. Security is everyone's responsibility. I would actually flip that on its head and say, to the degree that we are requiring people to do the right thing for our industrial control systems to be secure, we are increasing our chances of failure. A good analogy for this is the seatbelts and airbags statistics. Now in the United States, seatbelts became mandatory in cars in 1963. So if you bought a car after 1963, it had a seatbelt. And as you can see here in this seatbelt adoption curve, there was very little adoption of seatbelts in those first 20 years from 60 to, 63 to 83. Only 14% of the people put on their seatbelt, use their seatbelt. And this is despite knowing, seeing the statistics that if you're wearing a seatbelt, your chance of being hurt or killed in a car accident were dramatically less. Now, from 85 to 95, the states began putting in laws saying seatbelts were mandatory. But even as late as 20, or even as late as 1993, we see that just 66%, two thirds of the people are using a seatbelt. So now we've got a case where people know that if they use a seatbelt, they're reducing their risk of injury or fatality in a car accident, and it's a law and still one third of the people are not using their seatbelt. And then we go all the way from 2015 to present day, we've gotten it up to 90% seatbelt usage, but still 10%, even when there's click it or ticket campaigns where people will get tickets if they don't wear their seatbelt, still 10% of the people don't do the right thing in their own self-interest. Now compare that to the airbag. The airbag, became mandatory in the United States in 1991. And almost immediately, well not almost, immediately after an airbag is in the car, it's starting to work. So you are already getting the protection that you need from that control because you're not relying on the human to do anything. So I would say we should flip this argument on how do we get our users, how do we get our people to do more? I would suggest we flip that on their head and say, how do we require less of our people? How do we make it so that they don't have to do anything? We should be removing the burden from them, not saying they're gonna to need to do more. Basically, all they should need to do is authenticate themselves and tell us if something looks really crazy, such as someone they don't know sitting down in the control room and starting to operate the plant, 
or maybe some ransomware or malware message popping up on their screen. Other than that, I don't want to rely on the engineer, the technician, the operator to do anything security related because that's increasing my chance for failure. Now on the technology side, we're also seeing this. We're seeing, I really don't like this. We're seeing that it's actually a race, it seems, a contest to see who can put the most good practice security controls from the enterprise into their OT system. And this is happening for good reason, not good reason, but an understandable reason. The board, the C-levels, they think they might have a risk. They're hiring some large consulting firm to come in and they're auditing the OT system against good practices in the enterprise. And to no one's surprise, it's found lacking. So then they say, you need to do all these things, but there, all these things have no consideration of the actual effort it takes and the risk reduction it's achieving. Patching being the most visible example. Patching makes a lot of sense if it's something that is accessible through the security or perimeter. But if someone is inside your security perimeter and you're like 99% of the other control systems that are using insecure by design protocols and level one devices, PLCs, controllers, applying some patch isn't really stopping the bad guy from achieving what they want to achieve. So what you should be doing is you should be looking at efficient risk reduction. Every possible thing that you could do from a technical control standpoint, you should say, is this the best way for me to spend my next dollar or my next hour on securing my OT system? Is this where I'm getting the maximum risk reduction for the next unit of resource I apply? Now, sometimes that will be security controls, things like security perimeters, that patching things accessible through the perimeter, application whitelisting, recovery and backup. Typically, if you're new to your security program, you're going to find that some of these likelihood reduction security controls are what will be your most efficient risk reduction at the beginning. But once you get past that early stage, that's where you have to be really careful. And you also want to make sure you look at both sides of the risk equation, likelihood reduction and consequence reduction. Because what I'm finding more often than not is after the initial likelihood reduction are put in place, consequence reduction is very often the most efficient risk reduction for an asset owner. Now I want to go full loop here and go back to that security policy. About once a year, I get a client that coerces me into actually helping them with their policy or their governance document. It's, it's drudgery. It's not fun work. But what I've learned over the past decades is for security policy, it's very important to write audit statements. So for every must and shall, there should be a corresponding audit statement that you test that. This does two things. One, it makes sure that your must and shall requirements are actually achievable and auditable. And two, it gives you a way to measure whether you're actually meeting your security policy. My original security policy that was 100 page long, if the company actually tried to implement that, they would realize that would cost them way too much and they would say no. It's the same thing with your technical controls. When you have selected them for their efficient risk reduction capability, each technical control should have a metric associated with it. That metric should say, is the control operating properly and is it providing the risk reduction that I expect? If you're not doing that, don't bother putting that security control in place. Now, I want to thank Daniel for inviting me to give this presentation. I've always wanted to participate in this event. It's just a bit far away from Hawaii, so it's, it was good to be able to do it virtually. If you are interested in my content or, or what's going on in the world of ICS and OT security, you can click on that QR code and, and that will take you to my Friday newsletter subscription page. And finally, just to conclude, I want to really point out that I think we should focus on doing the right thing. And this probably means doing the right thing correctly and means doing less. So don't just immediately jump to this, we have to do all these things because it's supposedly good. 
figure out what you want to do and do it well. Thank you.